progress is imaginable. Yes, it is imaginable. A progressive policy program is possible and potentially popular. That's a nice sentence with six P's in it. Or if you want to add three more, politically, the ALP should pursue it. A progressive policy program that's potentially politically popular. Second proposition is that change is necessary for the reasons I've already outlined. And the third proposition is that the obvious one, that the ALP is currently failing to inspire. It doesn't seem likely to succeed either at the state or the federal level of the next round of elections. Is this the fault of leadership? Is Albo the problem? Is Jody the problem? Or is there something more systemic at stake? Here's my second story. It tries to dig a bit deeper into that last proposition. In other words, while accepting that progress is imaginable and change is necessary, I think we have to develop a more sophisticated view of one of the obstacles to actually getting a good outcome. First, here I would point out that it is very hard for the ALP to replace the Tory coalition at elections in Australia. Looking back over the last 70 years, 70 years, that's more or less the lifetime of people in this room. Uh, I'm sure no one would admit to being above it, although there's a few quite well below it. I'm a little above it, and throughout my lifetime, therefore, it can be said that Labour has only defeated or you know, snatched government from the Tory opposition, so from the Tories, three times in the federal, federal election in the last 70 years. In 1973 with Gough Whitlam, uh, 72, sorry, 72, then uh, 83 with, with Hawke, and then in 07 with uh, Kevin Gunn. At the state level, Labour has only knocked the Tories off twice in 70 years. Slightly misleading figure because Labour was in government at the start of the period for quite a long period of time. In fact, people always talked about the New South Wales being a naturally Labour state. But actually, since those early days, uh, only Neville Rand and Bob Carr uh, have knocked the Tories off in a state election. So the chances of overcoming that historical uh, difficulty ha have to be acknowledged. It's not easy for the Labour opposition to knock off a Tory The track record is not propitious. Second proposition, also very deeply sobering, is I think there's some evidence that the ALP is in long-term decline in terms of its uh, party support. For some similar reasons that the trade union movement is in long-term decline. The trade union movement at the start of the period I'm talking about the, uh, used to cover about a half of the workforce, now it's about 10%. Uh, what's happened to, to make these things uh, so different in Australian society. It's something to do with class relations, or perhaps more importantly, people's perception of their class interests. With the growth of a, a working class that increasingly has adopted middle class aspirations, uh, the commitment to a sort of a labor politics is demonstrably weaker. Affluent society, people wanting to become little capitalists, whether it's through being self-employed tradespeople or through owning an investment property and gaining some capital or appreciation through real estate values. These, these aspirations, people often look to, to the liberals as more likely to create the environment in, in which uh, they're, they're likely to succeed. 
So while I'm not trying to present a coherent analysis of all the relevant factors here, I would suggest that life has got tougher for the Labour Party because it's got to win over a broader stratum of swinging voters that don't naturally align with a Labourist class position. It's, and it's no good saying, well, they should, if they don't. We have, we have to face up to reality, or face up to realty, if I can pursue that horrible <laughs> pun. <laughs> Real estate. <laughs> well, therefore, I would suggest the challenges facing uh, Labour are more difficult, but the challenges facing any government are now more difficult. We live in an era where the nature of work has changed, so much more insecure. The inequality in society has increased. Uh, the, the, our relationship with the environment has become increasingly stressful. Climate change is the most uh, wicked of, of all those problems. And it's so much easier for politicians to wish all that hard stuff away because they know in their heart of hearts that they can't do it. And it's easier, therefore, to uh, pursue policies that sort of sound pleasantly reassuring in rhetoric while failing to address what actually needs to be done. Yeah. And, and I think you can see that manifestly in, in the current federal government. Morrison is little more than an ad man. He's, he's a say he's got sales pitching. He's got a little answer, a few words of, of, of moderate uh, about everything that, that's thrown up. But there's no policy program. There's no, no coherent agenda. It's just keeping your bums on, on, on the sit, the right seats of the Parliament House uh, as long as you can by, by spinning a yarn. And, and I, I fear that Labour is drawn into this process at the same way, faced with very difficult problems and learning from past experiences that attempts to introduce a carbon tax to deal with um, climate change problems, albeit a terribly tentative start, gets pilloried by Abbott, who then becomes the next uh, Prime Minister of Australia on the strength of axing the tax. You know, no wonder politicians are scared off of dealing with deeply profound problems and take recourse in uh, rhetoric and, and cheap shots at, at their political opponents. So this, I think, is the context in which Labour and Alba in particular face an enormous task ahead. Now, they've decided on a strategy that is clearly to let the government lose the next election. Now, of course, it's, it's not a, an odds-on winner because during the period of the COVID pandemic, all around the place, with the obvious exception of Trump, uh, Incumbent governments getting re-elected, and in Tasmania just uh, last weekend. So it's, a, it's a, not a winning strategy, um, but you can see why they've done it. They want to emphasise labour values, not even policies, but the values in the hope that somehow or other, when it comes to close to the election, they, they roll out the policies and will say, "Oh yeah." That sounds like a good thing. But in my experience, and I'm sure many of you in the room would know that if you want to actually change the direction of a government's political process, you've got to do a lot of groundwork. It's not just a matter of coming up with some uh, cheap policy proposals close to an election. Uh, Bill Shorten uh, had some good policies and didn't get elected. Yeah. 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 And I think Chalk would have been a good prime minister and he'd been elected and carried out a good political program. But you can see why Albo and his team have shied away from pursuing a similar strategy which uh, was electorally unsuccessful. So I'm not an apologist here for Albo. I do know him on a personal level over a long, long period of time. And I'm happy during the discussion to uh, reflect on his capacity to show good leadership for the party. But I think I've said enough just to 
broaden out the discussion beyond the individual to the context in which labour is currently operating. A party that we must have as our next government, but faces enormous obstacles in getting there. Over to you, Stuart. Thanks very much, Frank. Um, I'm going to uh, spell out what I regard as three criteria of leadership, politically, in big organisations um, and elsewhere. The first is that uh, you have to have a sense of identity. You have to be seen by the public as uh, knowing, knowing what you stand for, what you believe in, and that you'll hang on to it. The, uh, so that there's it's somebody or some cause which is easily identified and somehow palatable, if not appealing. It's what uh, the communications theorist Marshall McLuhan years ago called, I mean, he called it the medium, it's the massage. That, uh, the, so that that projection of self, which um, a famous American sociologist called the presentation of self in everyday life, and the, the subtitle of that famous book was called Image Management, in the way uh, Frank's comments about Morrison um, suggest that he might, he might have read a couple of pages from that book. The, the second yardstick um, is what I call gravitas, a sense of weight, a sense of authority. Uh, is this person more to be believed? Are they worth keeping the, the radio on when they're speaking? There's a sense in which I regard the new Labour leader in, in Britain, Keir Starmer, as having that sense of gravitas. I wish he had a bit of humour. I wish he could laugh and smile a lot more, because that's one of the, one of the crucial qualities that's distinctly absent from all the deliberations that seem to go on in the House of Representatives in, in Canberra. So that, that gravitas is, is, is a, it's about the way to where you're not going to be intimidated by news corporation. You're going to take them on. You're not going to allow the, uh, the so-called battlers of the Western suburbs to be intimidated by the front page of the Daily Telegraph. Um, you're going to um, uh, say what you believe and explain easily, what not not in 23 paragraphs or 21 or more policies which Labour had in the last election, so that people can have a sense of hope, a sense of they can begin to share it. And you actually have to repeat it. I mean, I'm slow enough, I have to read books several times to get the message. These days, nobody reads books at all, I gather. You just go to www. <laughs> um, now, the third yardstick of leadership is about whether you project some vision of a future that looks different from what's already predictable, that's different from the mainstream, that in this case, in the way Frank has, uh, has mentioned that the whole host of issues, uh, not least of which is the question of climate change, uh, dealing with climate change. So you have to say quite simply that reducing emissions is crucial, but that is never going to be sufficient to, um, to deal with climate change. We are talking here about the way changes in the way we live together on, on planet Earth. Now, those, so those those are the three yardsticks that I play around with in a way when I was you know, running reasonably big organisations in, in Colorado in the States, but certainly in all the controversies that Frank and I endured at slightly different times of, of history at the University of Sydney, and sticking up for, in Frank's case, political economy, in my case, uh, peace studies, etc. And since, since Incidentally, if I can just make a little, if I can get off the point for a minute, at a time when all sorts of appalling people like that Mike Bazillo or Peter Dutton are, are banging their chests about war, the University of Sydney closed down peace studies. I mean, who wants, you know, when we're preparing for war, who wants to talk about peace? And in a way, that 
story is, is crucial. Because this is the last point I'm gonna make. And I noticed Frank several times used the word story because this is the crucial issue. If we're to move towards a different way of living together post COVID, it's no good talking about the aggregate of policies. You have to have a different story because it's the, sto the story about uh, a different economy, a different way of using power, the complete outlawing of violence in every feature of domestic and foreign policy. I mean, the litmus test could be, could argue, the outlawing of um, domestic violence, but that relates further along the continuum relates to um, Australia's refusal to sign the treaty outlawing nuclear weapons. You know, we're, we're so fascinated with violence that um, uh, we'd rather risk the elimination of planet Earth than change the policy. So final point, I want to, I want to talk about telling a story. Albanese has to have a better story, an interesting story, a story of hope, a story, a story of feasibility. We have to have, without doubt, a different economy, but I don't think we go, people won't listen. The aggregate of intricate details about abolishing, um, uh, you know, the, the fascination with realty, help me, what are, they, what are we trying to abolish? The stuff that's, the, the policies that stuff yeah, labor. Yeah, 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 negative gearing. That's, that's only a small part of the story. We're talking about fellowship. We're talking about sharing. We're talking about interdependence of people locally and internationally. That, that has to be a part of the story. And that's a brilliant American commentator, author, America, Nancy McLean, in a book called um, Democracy in Chains, says you can't have, you can't have uh, economic freedom and political liberty. In a if you want democracy, you can't have both. You've got to choose. And we've constantly chosen um, uh, economic freedom. Frank's referred to it in terms of people becoming little capitalists, having, you know, investing more so that we have massive inequality. And we have these wretched news items night after night, almost boasting that house prices in Sydney and Melbourne have gone up. So the I'm a great, I'm a great, um, words not believer, but I, I've been following that man with a sort of acrobatic mind, the Israeli Yuval Harari, who, who talks about the way certain revolutions have occurred in the history of, of mankind. And the revolutions, particularly since the time that Homo sapiens had cognition, have occurred because of stories. He argues that Socialism was a story, is a story, but a different way of living and acting. You don't have to read all of Das Kapital to know that. The science, in a way, is a story. We've got this massive story at the moment about whether to get a vaccine or not, as though, as though the post-COVID society or the future of the Labour Party depends on whether 70% of people are vaccinated and have herd immunity so we can get back to this frightening phenomenon called normal. Now, the story, this is the last point I'm going to make. Um, lots of people, when I'm speaking, are always grateful when I say this is the last point I'm going to make. Um, and now I've forgotten what the last point is. <laughs> 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 oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, sorry, uh, Alice. Uh, the, it, it's... Albanese and co have a chance to talk about imagining a better world, imagining a different society, imagining the notion of justice in post-COVID Australia. But in a way, there is going to be no post-COVID. COVID is here forever. You only have to look at the melting of the um, the tundra in Siberia to know that there are all sorts of pathogens. Nobody has a clue what to do. So the bits, so the qualities that have emerged in the way people live together and began to respect one another through wearing masks and social distancing and so on, 
um, need to become not some peripheral activity that you do at the weekend, but would become central to the way we live. He's got to talk about a way of living together. I mean, one of the things that Harari says, well, look, the arrival of uh, artificial intelligence is going to produce millions and millions of what he called useless people. I don't think they, I don't think it's useless. I think it really heralds a different way of living. And of course, the, the issue is, because in a way, I haven't been employed for 22 years. So I'm one of the useless people. But I have the privilege of having an income. It's called superannuation. Enough to live on. Enough to live on. So the issue, so so the issue, the issue, one of the issues is about income. It's not about, and, and, and that carries with it the incredibly difficult but important challenge of re redefining what we mean by work. Now, two minutes ago I said I was going to finish and I haven't, but I think that's the point at which I should stop and we'll take q and a and if the other speaker david park emerges from his um, western suburbs traffic jam we'll we'll invite him to speak as well but uh, thank you for that i'll give it to you my name is james Mavis. um if you were albert easy you were to announce the the the, the uh, election tonight the platform. What would be the three key points if you were wanted to tell an Albert Easy story? What would you be saying? Just three points. Yeah. Okay. First is we're going to have a green new deal in Australia. We're going to take climate change seriously, and we're going to do it in a way that doesn't destroy uh, people's jobs. We're going to plan for a transition to a green, sustainable economy. Second thing we're going to do is we're going to have a more equal society. We can't wave a magic wand and do it overnight, but we're going to do tax reform, which ensures that the rich pay a bigger share of the tax, which will then, in the longer term, enable us to create better social services uh, and eventually a guaranteed minimum income for all. And thirdly, we're going to take our relationships with Indigenous Australians seriously. We're going to follow through on the recommendations of Uluru to have a completely new basis for relationships between the Indigenous people and all of the rest of us who are immigrants in this nation. I think you're giving us the uh, well, I, I'm going to cop out by saying I agree totally with what Frank says, um, and in a way ought to be the leader of the Labour Party on the basis of those three points. I want to add one other thing, if I can. I'm not really copying out of the three points. I want this country to be an international citizen. If we had a notion of justice and internationalism, there's no way we would have forbidden Australian citizens who happen to be in India from not being allowed to come to back to this country. So the, the greatest document of the 20th century, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which, I don't know, 20, 30 years ago, King Beasley as leader asked Frank and I to write the document on which the domestic and foreign policies of Australia would be based on the 30 clauses of that important document, the highest aspirations for the common man and woman. And uh, I've still got it somewhere, Frank, and he, um, uh, he, uh, he, Kim Beasley, thanked us for it and it's still gathering dust. But the point about that document is that there's a blueprint there. It's, it's, it's a fascinating, it's a crucial piece of work. So in addition to, to Frank's points about, um, about uh, climate change, equality and commitment to indigenous people, I want to add that international bit. Now, David's just arrived from his traffic jam, so I will welcome you to the, um, to the thank you for escaping from the traffic jam. Uh, and here's the microphone. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.
Um, sorry, comrades, I unfortunately had to visit a client in Western Sydney, so I, I was subject to Western Sydney traffic. Um, thanks, everybody. So I'm not an official Labor Party figure or anything like that. The most senior position I have is president of the Leichhardt Labor Party branch, but hopefully I can provide some insights about, I think, the position that the Labor Party's in, sort of dangers that we've got going forward. Um, Basically, what everyone in the Labor Party is talking about at the moment, everyone who's a sensible, rank and file uh, activist with sort of left wing sympathies, is there's a lot of there's a lot of danger, well, there's, a, there's a lot of trouble being experienced by a lot of the parties around the world who are in a similar position to us. So there's a, there's a concept called personification, which is taken from the Labor Party in Greece. So. If you don't know, the Greek Labor Party came to power in 2009, got 43% of the vote. Uh, six years later, after implementing austerity, um, they then had 4% of the vote. So there's this idea basically that the Labor Party in Australia has a permanent right to be a party of government or be a strong opposition party. But that's not necessarily true. I mean, there's other, there's other parties in the world, like the, the French, everyone thought the French Socialist Party would always be. Um, one of the two main parties there. It's gone from having two houses plus the presidency to 6% of the vote in the last election. Um, the Irish Labour Party implemented austerity in their government there. Um, they collapsed as well. Uh, the German Social Democratic Party, the great party of um, Friedrich Engels and the, the foundation of Marxism, they collapsed as well. Looks like the Greens are going to probably be winning the election there in a coalition with the, with the Conservatives. Um, there's a lot of others like the Italians and the Dutch, the Dutch Socialist parties, they've all collapsed as well. So I think the danger we have really is if the, if the next government, the next Labor government on a federal level um, doesn't make, make the interests of their supporters and their base, there's a real danger that the ALP, the, the ALP will personify itself and we won't have a strong Labor Party anymore. Um, Look, it's a theory of a lot of people in the Labor Party, but that's already happened in New South Wales um, on a state level. If you look at the most recent polling, we now only have 23% of the primary vote, um, which is astonishing. And that was, a, that was a party that had government for the vast majority of the 20th century, had government for um, had government for 16 years, I think it was, or 17 years, um, from the 90s until the late 2000s. And we really saw a model of what you can do to destroy your base from that government. So what that, gov what that government did, obviously, was, I mean, everybody here would know, obviously, um, privatise all the assets, the electricity system, um, engage in the greatest acts of corruption since the Rum Rebellion, um, get rid of um, a Labour Party Premier, Nathan Rees, who is at least saying he was dedicated to getting rid of Eddie O'Bee and George Rapoti, got up on a roster and said, there, um, if you vote for someone else as leader today in the caucus ballot, there'll be a puppet of Joe Party in NDOB, and then doing it. And that's really a sort of patent way you can destroy any credibility of the government. And there's a real theory now, it's a real fear that the Labour Party in New South Wales is never ever going to win government again. I mean, there's no, there's no guarantee things will bounce back. Maybe the Liberals will be there forever, maybe some other party will take over. Who knows? So I think there's a real threat that could happen federally. Um, there was some Sydney Morning Herald polling that came out last week, which had a look at how the Labour Party was doing um, nationwide in different states. We're doing really well in West Australia, doing pretty well in Queensland, Victoria. Um, but if you look at the Federal Labour Party polling in New South Wales, we're at 29% of the vote, um, which I can tell you is appalling. Um, so I think there's a real danger that if, if we're next in government, I mean, the, the, the topic of the Starks panel, I think, is I've like Labor leadership real or imagined. If you look at what the Labor Party's pledged to do in government, I think there's a real threat that we're not going to be able to address any of the needs of our supporters and that things that we're going to be doing are going to be actively harmful. So I'm actually surprised that the last Gillard, the Gillard government, right Gillard government, didn't disillusion more people. But there we go. We still have a stable position, sort of federally at least. But um, we recently had a national conference um, in which there were certain positions that were adopted. Um, the best bet we can have of what we're going to be doing in government is what the National Conference adopts. Um, just some examples. So 
Our position on call same gas federally um, is that we don't know how the policy on call same gas. Um, for young people, I, I, I would have found myself as a young person until a couple of years ago. Um, now I'm restricted to wearing a tie and suit, unfortunately. But no, that's, that's, that's one of the number one issues with young people it's the climate crisis. And it's something we're going to have to live with. And not having a position on call same gas and fracking, frankly, is something that's not going to be possible when we're in government. And it doesn't bear well if our policy at the moment is we don't have one. Obviously, it's even worse on a state level. Um, down behind the by election, obviously, um, we've taken a very pro coal road. So, Mr. Files Labor now supports expanding coal lines, um, and we're supporting the narrow road coal and gas project. Uh, I really question the viability of that by having a long term, um, a long term mm -hmm. basis of youth support, personally. Um, the same with higher education. So, the commitment we've got in, in the platform, the national platform, is um, of no real lack of fees. They're not going to change anything with X. There's going to be some partial funding restored. But in terms of, um, I mean, we've got, we've got a downwardly mobile sort of millennial class that really has reducing job prospects, but they're being absolutely, um, well, being absolutely entrenched in, in debt at this point. And we're doing nothing to relieve that interest either. Job seeker, there's no commitment to increasing job seeker above the poverty line, even though Scott Morrison proved it was possible. Um, they're still committed to things like mutual obligations, which are the sort of punitive things that are imposed upon people seeking um, seeking Centrelink benefits. Um, affordable housing. Uh, the most significant thing the platform says is that Labor recognises the, the significance of rest rent assistance. It doesn't say it'll increase it. It doesn't say anything about rent control or building more affordable housing. That's it. Uh, refugees, uh, there's no commitment to scrapping offshore detention at all. Um, it's fine with mandatory detention. It's um, very committed to boat turnbacks. Um, casualization, there's no commitment to rolling back casualization at all, uh, except for providing an objective test in legislation, which can be worked around. Um, and then some foreign affairs issues that are also pretty, pretty disappointing. So on the issue of Palestine, there's a commitment to recognizing Palestinian statehood, but doing nothing else about Israel's crimes at all, which is quite, quite bad. Well, look, basically, I think, I think the problem is this is a government which is trying to get back into power. Well, it's a party that's trying to get back into power through the alternate small target strategy. It's not offering its base anything at all, really, in terms of policies. It's solely negative, criticizing the Morrison government. And the issue is if they get into government, what's it going to mean in terms of what we can do for the people who rely on us? Because if you have a, if you have a, if you have a permit, if you have a, if you have a government that gets in that does absolutely nothing for people when their living standards are declining, but it doesn't seem like a recipe for success. And I think there is an alternative strategy for what we can do looking at other countries around the world. So look at the United, the United States, obviously, the Democratic Socialists of America. Um, until recently, I would see the left control of the British Labour Party. That was very inspiring with Jeremy Corbyn. Unfortunately, that's um, been reconquered by the Blairites, and I don't think that's going to come, come back anytime soon. Um, well, look, they actually do things about actually offering policies that are actually in the interest of their banks. So, for example, for the, for the constituency of young people who are experiencing declining job prospects, they're offering free higher education, they're offering debt relief, um, they're offering rent control. I mean, things that would make the miserable sort of life that most young people are, are looking forward to over the next 10 years a lot better. And it actually worked for them. Actually, people flocked into them for young people. We had Glastonbury Festival in England where... You know, there were tens of thousands of people cheering Jeremy Corbyn's name. They all voted for him in the 2017 election. Um, they also took the climate crisis seriously. So obviously the Green New Deal policy that's, that's being promoted by the Democratic Socialists of America. I mean, that's a policy that really takes seriously the climate crisis and also the economic crisis that face people as well. And it offers something to people. I mean, it actually says we, we see there's a problem and this is how we're going to solve it and they're going to do something about it. Our climate policy really is as, as, as close you can get to, to nothing as possible, which is very disappointing. Um, I mean, there are lots of other things they're trying to do. But basically, what, what, what the sort of philosophy I think is, is there are things the state can do to help people. Uh, we're committed to doing them. And if you vote for us, we will do them. And that seems like a much better way of preventing your base from declining than the alternative. Um, 
so look, I've been really interested recently in the idea of whether or not this could happen in the Australian Labour Party. Um, I've been really, I've been reading a book by, I've read a book by a man named Lewis Lincoln, who's sort of the preeminent, um, preeminent sort of political scientist who studies the British Labour Party. And he had this idea basically that the, the difference between the British Labour Party and the Australian Labour Party is under Blair, but they used to be pretty similar before the 90s. So in the 90s, what happened was Blair took over and basically the way he sustained his authority was through like plebiscitary democracy. So he had mandates from members directly in direct ballots, which allowed him to be the leader. And he could say, well, I'm gonna ignore everything the unions want, ignore everything the members want. I have the real mandate from the real members. They voted for me once, that's it. Um, that system's actually what like Jeremy Corbyn win. So there actually were enough young people in the Labour Party who joined the Labour Party who voted for him in that ballot. The Blairites got overconfident and democratised the system because they thought they could win with a mass media that he won by accident. There was so much power concentrated in the hands of the British Labour Party leader that he was able to do able to do that. But the ALP itself is very much not, it's, it has no system like that at all. So it's, 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 it's um, the people here know the history of the New South Wales right and sort of machine in the 20th century. Yeah. Well, obviously, horrible, horrible, horrible machine. Very good at what they did though, obviously. Um, but the part of history basically is in 1940, the left lost control of the Australian Labour Party in New South Wales by committing to the Nazi Soviet non aggression pact. Um, so here's Evans' party. They got expelled. Um, the New South Wales right took over, and the same faction has been in control ever since. Um, they did some good things in the 50s and 60s in their governments then, and the RAND government that was okay. They set up some sort of mild social democratic policies, built a lot of schools, built a lot of roads, built some trains. Um, had a pretty good industrial relations system. What's that? National parks. Uh, National parks was good as well. Um, but what's, what we've maintained now is we've lost any of the sort of Catholic ethos of the New South Wales right, and all we have now is the machine. But it's a machine that's dedicated solely to its own power. And there was a really interesting look. There was a review last year, the year before, um, by Michael Lavarch into the corruption of the New South Wales Labour Party and how it could be reformed. And Jamie Clements, who was the former General Secretary of the party, wrote a very interesting submission which looked at how the actual system worked. And it's very interesting. Basically, the General Secretary decides everything. That person's always from the right. And because the New South Wales Labour Party has the most numbers in the national, national executive, they can get anything done. Now, what does that mean for our idea of getting a Jeremy Corbyn in Australia? Well, there's a rule called the NPN 40 rule, which allows the New South Wales Administrative Committee to basically rig a ballot. They can do that with the national executive too. So they can basically prevent socialists getting elected in parliament. Whereas the Labour never went that, never went that far in the British Labour Party. Um, the conference itself is pretty undemocratic. 10% of the conference is appointed with the previous conference. It's the buff to the right. And the upper house itself is completely factional. Um, there's no contestability at all. But basically what, basically what this system means is that it's really difficult for a socialist to ever get in a position like Jeremy Corbyn was, get into parliament and get elected. So I don't know what that means in terms of like what the path forward is as a member of the Labour Party. I don't know why I'm there, but um, I, I guess what we basically want to do is have enough members to join to try and democratise the party in order for there actually be, to be some meaning for a reform. Um, personally, I think there is a path. I think the path basically is enough people join, they actually run a community campaign, a campaign inside of mass resistance. We can actually get sort of a crisis legitimacy of this ruling clique and then have a, a membership revolution. Uh, maybe that's a completely insane idea, but that's the one that both of us are there who are sticking to it. That's what we, that's what we think, I think. Um, but look, basically, in summary, I think the platform that we're offering to the next election, it's dangerous to us. I don't think it's going to help us win, but if we do get into government, we've got a real threat. We're not going to do anything for our base at all. Um, we're, very un we're very unfortunate if that happens, but if possible, we, we will alienate a certain percentage of our, um, of our supporters. And then the Labour Party will soccer fire. And it could be that the, the next government is the last Labour government. Um, for our generation, it won't be forever. I mean, it's happened overseas, it could happen here. Um, so that's that's basically the pitch. I'm sorry um, for being late, but um, thank you for listening to me. Okay, look, David, uh, that was first rate, if, given that you just emerged from, from a traffic jam. We actually started uh, questions, which I'm sure 
and David's analysis would have provoked more. So let's let's continue with the questions. Yeah. David, you might want to come up here to field questions. That was uh, very inspiring. Andrew Lang. Um, it's great to see you young people powering along. I, I've um, <coughs> been a member of the party for 50 years. And most of my left wing friends, you know, they're, what the hell are you muck around with that mob for? They've done sweet all and they won't do anything. But when, when you hear your words, I was quite inspired. And I'm a member of the Paddington branch, and there's a lot of youngsters up there too that are very inspiring. But my fundamental question is for the three of you relating to the issues where, where I came in first with the Labour Party in terms of the connection with the Labour movement. And as Frank says, the membership around the country is defined in such a massive degree. You wonder about the traditional links and the possibility of keeping in touch with the members. And you wonder about the possibility of the leadership actually taking that on board. So I was just wondering whether or not you think it's possible to create a new accord or a new combination of links with the labor movement. Is, uh, uh, Sally McManus in, in the ACTU is showing a powerful storm of connecting and also making connections with the federal cabinet through COVID, which I thought was brilliant. Uh, very difficult to presume that this will continue, but I'm just wondering whether or not we should be more focusing within the Labour Party in that connection with the, with the working people who struggle. That's a great question. Unless you have meetings and dialogue and conversation along the lines that you mentioned, there won't be the chemistry of different ideas and the coherence of people. I'll give you two examples. One's totally negative, the other one's positive. It's about policy. The negative one is that a recent meeting that I had with a, a federal Labour MP, when I went to talk about the um, absurd Labour Party policy of recognising two-state solution for uh, the Palestinians, when it's, it's, it's like 15, 20 years out of date, but they keep reciting it. She wasn't, she was very polite. I said, look, I'll come and speak to the local Labour Party because I've spent a lot of time in the Gaza Strip and the occupied territories. She wasn't blindly interested. It was, it was as though if I'd said, look, have you read an Indian Blighton book lately? She would have been more excited. Um, the second, more positive experience concerns the defence of universal health insurance 20 years ago when, when the, the government and the um, procedural specialists tried to bring it down. And we had a, a, a coalition of, I was one of the academics, were a few members of the Doctors' Reform Society and the war fits. And we worked for a year and a half to, to insist that Medicare needed to be defended. It was a platform for, for the for, for the Labour government. We could, and, uh, and, and it happened, but because that, if you want to build the civil society, you, the, the, the major plank, the major foundation is universal health insurance, creation of the Labour Party. But it's often, but that, that commitment occurred because we had meetings a week <laughs> and we talked a lot about it. But that's my response. Right? Yeah, I, I want to make a brief reference to the accord because Andrew, you, you mentioned that in your question. That uh, and, and obviously, it's a touchstone for a lot of people in Australia as to whether the accord was a good way forward for Australia. Some people would think it was a, a class sellout. But I think that principle, which uh, has a, a legitimate place in Labour history, of, of the political wing of the Labour movement working in conjunction with the industrial wing of the Labour movement, and trying also, I think, in the modern context, to broaden that out to include representatives of environmental movement, community organisations, so that we get something that focuses not just on fairness of, of, of wage relations with, with the interests of capital, but also getting a more sustainable society, a more socially just society. So a new accord could deliver what I refer to as a Green New Deal. Now, Green New Deal's got a rather American flavour to, to the phraseology. In the Australian context, I think a green accord could be quite a tractable proposition. 
in other words, one that does involve participation in policy formulation, <laughs> policy implementation of, of the Labour Party, the Labour movement more generally, and environmental and community interests. Surely that is a saleable possibility, as well as one that is empowering for those who get drawn into the process itself. These are possibilities, but uh, David knows more about whether they're actually practically on the agenda. So I'm, a, I'm not a subject matter in the accord at all. I'm like a um, subject matter expert in the accord at all. I feel a bit embarrassed talking about this on the same stage as Frank Stilwell. Um, but not all, what, what I will say is that I've read a, I've read a book by Elizabeth Humphreys about this issue, and I was totally persuaded by it. And I think the worst thing the Labour Party could do would be engaging in um, an accord with the union movement. I think it's the worst thing the union movement could do. I think the accord really hurt the union movement in this country. I think it really hurt the Labour Party. Um, I think it's one of the reasons why there was decomposition in a sort of working industrial working class base the Labour Party. And I think that'd be why um, wage restraint, um, a failure to commit to preventing manufacturing jobs going offshore, um, and just generally a, a demobilisation of the union movement and its militant, militant elements of it. Super and uh, and super anyway, is fantastic and Medicare is fantastic too. Obviously, that's true. Um, I remember it because um, it really it was much better than how I was breaking up everything in the great man with jobs. At least it wasn't cool. People knew what they were going to be getting. And it was a certain level of maintaining a slight improvement in job uh, situations. And you know, this was a guarantee of some sort. I totally agree with you. The Labour Party was always in power. They lost power. My, my, my question, obviously, is just saying, why did the Labour Party legislate for these policies? Okay, more questions. Okay, I, I just like to say how impressed I was with David, and that's unusual um, <laughs> for what I consider to be the right one in the Labour Party, which is normally in control. I want to say a bit of not exactly deja vu because it was for my time. But I did wonder when you were talking about the way forward, whether just as the Whigs disappeared and the Labour Party became the opponents of the Tories, you have ever thought that the left wing of the Labour Party has far more in common with the Greens and that it might be a very good thing for those two to join and leave isolated the right wing of the Labour Party? <laughs> We'll take the second question, then we'll, we'll answer the two together. Well, I don't know if it's a question, really, but I was very happy that Jeremy Corbyn was mentioned because I think what killed Jeremy Corbyn was a story that is an anti Semite. And that came back to what we suffer from very badly in Australia, I think, and that's the Murdoch press. I think that he was so vilified, and I'm Jewish actually, but I was never, ever persuaded Jeremy Corbyn really was an anti But that's what people thought. So he did lose that position that he should have had. Uh, I want to say, Frank, that in your listing of what's happened to the Labour, no, I think your listing of what's happened to the Labour Party in a lot of other countries, not just Australia, but you left out a very important one, and that's Israel Palestine. Because that was once the Labour Party in Israel was the foundation of that country. And it was a very different Israel. And now the Labour Party in Israel is a tiny, tiny nothing. So how come? Thank you. 
Great question, Alice. Um, sure. Well, in terms of the first question, I guess the issue is, um, I, I think a lot of people in the Greens have a lot in common with people on the Labour left. I probably politically have a lot more common with left-wing members of the Greens than I do with people on the Labour right. Absolutely. Um, but the, the record is, whenever, what's gone out? But whenever you split from the Labour Party, you always lose. Whoever retains the Labour Party always wins. Every time there's been a left-wing split or a right-wing split from the Labour Party in Australia, the DLP, Hughes Evans Party, um, Lang, they've always lost. It's not sustainable to leave. Um, it may be the Labour Party itself collapses. If that happens, maybe there's a path forward from the, the left and Labour Party outside of it. Um, but so long as the Labour Party is one of the major parties, I guess don't see that being a viable path forward. Yeah, uh, well, I'll, I'll respond to, to, to Alice's question about Israel, Israel, Palestine. Can you hear? Okay. I mean, I can speak it's loudly enough. Yeah. Look, it's, it's, it's absolutely crucial because if anything marshals the solidarity of news corporation, it's to attack anybody who criticizes the, the government of Israel. And the, I mean, so much so that when Netanyahu arrived here and Turnbull was prime minister, he said, he, he announced at the, the airport at the, the meeting that Australian and Israeli values were the same. Um, so you now, I mean, let's be very clear. Let's use the word uh, fascism, which one should be usually cautious about. But that's what ha has happened in the election in the Israeli Knesset. There's no doubt that this is fascism on the march in Israel. And let's, in, in terms of my point about telling a story about the future, let's not be so cautious about using words like that if we qualify in the same way that Labour needs to be more confident about explaining what socialism is about and what the enormous benefits of the fellowship and solidarity of, of socialism are. are. But it's an absolutely key question about Israel. This is an online question. Thank you. Can you ask him? Was uh, you asked David Pink what more Labour could do for Citizen Assange after their unanimous motion to support the UK decision not to extradite? And that's from Cathy. Oh, no, it's, it's from an online viewer. Thank you. Uh, look, I don't know anything about Julian Assange, so. Well, look, a key question in any walk of life, particularly in public life, is whether you have the courage to stick up for universal human rights. And the, the, the treatment of Julian Assange is a test case. Why in the hell the Labour Party or any, or any leading politicians in this country have never found the courage to reject the determination of America to, to eliminate somebody who exposed the war crimes, the mayhem in Iraq and Afghanistan of the Americans, I do not know. I frequently, I frequently call to camera. Welcome to Trivia. How's everybody feeling? Oh, oh shit. Yes. Hello. I'm Jake. I'm your host for the night. I'm going to hold you. Hello. 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 Very fitting cover. Okay, well, look, in a way, the arrival of the trivia is the problem for the politics of Australia. <laughs> It's, the arrival of trivia suggests that the key issue, look, look, look. The key issue okay. is whether there's a, a special on pork chops in Woolworths or, or coals at the weekend. But that's the problem. But look, thank you for being here. Thank you, David, in particular, for making it.
One hundred dollars on the bar. Yeah. Yeah. Let's hear it, bro. I'll work for that. Yeah, yeah. 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 The issue is about the issue of children's so, time is about the church of pandemic. But in a month's time, we will have an evening with Anthony Lowenstein, who is really one of the best authorities on the Israeli Palestinian issue. You pass on that. That's it. Who's Mitch, you're asking? Oh my God, that was outrageous. What an incredible way to end. Think there? Yeah, what an incredible ending. Um, was Shocking. that? Was that a troll? Was that a troll? No, that's the quiz night. Oh my God, it was quiz night. Oh, okay. shit. That's a, yeah, oh, yeah. I, oh, mate, I have to take it up we, with them, but I couldn't do anything right now. My God, it happened okay. to us at, Polit at uh, Harold Park as well. No, no, at uh, Toxtus. Remember, at the okay. Toxtus. We used to be at the Toxtus. I can hardly hear you, Kathy. Oh, never mind. Never Talk mind. Talk to you later. I'll turn it All off. All right. Bye.